Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, what's in a name? Stellar's Animals, Part 4. Presented by NADHAB Expedition Leader, Christina Disney. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Take it away, Christina. Thank you so much, Rob. And thank you everyone who's tagged along for the story. We've made it all the way to part four. For folks who weren't with us, or just as a recap, we spent the last three parts of this series going through the journey, or specifically the journal, of a man named George Steller and his experiences on one of the uh, initial expeditions that sent out from Russia to discover, again, I always go back to this quote unquote discover, uh, the coast of Alaska to understand the resources that were there, to interact with the people that were already on these lands. And it was so much fun. And I were hoping today to kind of shift away from that. And we're gonna move away from sort of George Steller himself uh, and sort of shift into the lands and the, the peoples uh, that that initial discovery sort of kicked off and stuck with us there. So I, we're gonna say goodbye to sea voyages and we're gonna focus on where our story uh, is gonna kick off today. Is gonna to be what's called Russian America, which is not a phrase we hear very often today to say the least. Um, so yeah, there was an era in time where the coast of Alaska and quite a bit in along here was under the Russian domain and their trading posts there and the resources that they were extracting um, tell a different, very different story than the one that we would know today. So that's kind of the, the angle that we're going to shift from. We're going to go from sea voyages, we're going to go hang out on the land, and I want to kind of repaint some history, both in the sense that, uh, at least as a Canadian, when I think about this era in time, I was certainly uh, educated to think about the gold rush and about the fur trade. Oh yeah, and I just want to say this, for the folks who did follow along in our first one, two, and three. That red star there is Cape St. Elias, which was the very first place that they found land in Russia. So I just wanted to anchor that as a kind of like our focal point for the exploration of the rest of these lands, even though it's way, way further east than you might think they would have hit it. If you remember, it was quite the tumultuous journey that, uh, that our crew went on. So let's go look at the fur trade era. That's what came after the era of discovery, right? It was an era of re resource extraction, I would more likely say an era of resource exploitation, um, but I might be a bit biased depending on which narrative you want to follow there. Now, for most of us, when we think about the fur trade, or at least I would say when I think about the fur trade, I think about beavers. This is the most iconic one, especially as a Canadian. The beaver hangs out on our five cent coin. Um, most of our coins have animals on them, which at least one thing is I've always appreciated. But why beavers? Well, in the height of fashion in the 17 and 1800s, the beaver pelt was felted and used for all of these different hats. It was used for other things as well. But, you know, the hat at the time was certainly a matter of showing your station, of showing your wealth. And the beaver furs made the nicest ones. Now, at this point, the Europeans had pretty much hunted thoroughly or hunted out all of the, the beavers that they could find in their own countries, in their own lands. And so they had been scouring the world, and here was North America with many of them aplenty. Now, that's from a land perspective. I think we forget that there's also a marine perspective to the fur trade, and that as these adorable creatures as well, still in the rodent family, but these are sea otters. Sea otters are famous for multiple reasons, not only their cute and adorable faces, but also because they have the densest fur out of any animal on Earth. And this was very much prized. It was prized by the Europeans, but this gets into commerce. It was more prized by people in China. Now, this is an interesting thing. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna weave in some history here because we need some context of that. I think as biologists, and this is a very classic one, or when we think about nature, we just hone in on the animals, right? But the reality is that you have to take this kind of broader perspective to understand how we get into these different eras of, stability in an ecosystem. And this is really important when we talk about sea otters because sea otters themselves are a keystone species. 
What that means, right, is they're one of the ones that if we pull them out of the ecosystem, there is a whole trickle down effect that happens to all the other species that they hunt, then they're their prey and their prey, right? Keeping moving down the line. So let's roll back to the 1600s in China. And there is a new dynasty that comes in. The Qing dynasty takes over and they rule for the next 250, 270 years. So from about the 1600s up until the 1900s or so. And at the time, Europeans really want to trade with China. But China doesn't have, the Europeans don't really have anything that China wants. They're a very sophisticated culture and society. They have the things that the Europeans want, right? They want silk, they want their porcelain, their tea, uh, the actual tea cups, and then there's literally the tea itself, right? They want that trade. They want, you know, the silk road. We're kind of used to expressions like that. But the thing is that Europeans don't really have anything that the Chinese want, at least not in their own bounds. I mean, the only thing they kind of really want would be to trade silver, but the reality is that our Europeans are also kind of cash poor, so they don't have a lot of that to trade. But what they do get their hands on via their North American colonies are sea otter pelts. And these are so prized by the Chinese that the Chinese are willing to pay the weight of the pelt in silver for it. Now, this is a huge, huge industry. And it means that there's this vacuum, this ability to have that trade network, right? So ships, European ships go hunt or trade with indigenous people along the coast of North America, pick up those pelts, and it starts this big belt where they take those to Asia, trade them for tea, silk, uh, porcelain, China, and then bring that back to Europe, and they just start that cycle, right? And that's one of those big connectors that drives this whole thing. So it's an interesting one, right, because it ties us into fashion, it ties us into economics, because um, that, I should say, in the same way that it was beaver pelts that were being used for hats, the sea otter fur was used as trim. It wasn't even used, even though it's, you know, it wasn't used as a warmth factor, it was used as an elegance factor. It was for the wealth, for the rich. And so it's that same narrative, um, but just on a different perspective. And so I said this was Russian America, but they're not the only interests that are hanging out in the Pacific Northwest, chasing after this, uh, this very fuzzy form of gold or money at the time. The other folks who jumped in on this in around the 1770s or 1778. So if we go back to, we talk about George Steller, just briefly, right? He was on one of those initial discovery trips with Captain Bering, hence the Bering Sea. They were there, they arrived in 1741. Now it's about 30 years later where James Cook shows up, another big explorer of the time. And he gets to Nootka Sound. So that's here on Vancouver Island. And he starts trading with folks there. Now, an interesting thing is that there's still quite a few sea otter pelts to be traded, but they're a lower quality here than they are further north. And that has to do with animals adaptation to cold. So, and this is still true. Well, it's true in the past and it's true today, but northern animals have denser fur, even if it's the same species, because they have to uh, contend with that colder climate. Uh, even people who've maybe moved with your dog, right? If you live in one climate and you move with your dog, you spend a few years there, your dog will actually get a little bit thicker coat or undercoat in between those sheddings. So it's a response to that, right? And so they start trading for these slightly lower quality furs, but they can't advance north because the Russians are there. There's also the Spanish, there's a bunch of different people all competing for this same, same area, same resource. Now, why was this all worth so much? So uh let's let's kind of do again tie this into a bit of economics so a sea otter pelt in the 1760s or let's just say the, like the late 1700s is worth about 20 rubles if you were to sell it on Kamcha uh, kamchatka so let's go back to our russians for a second because that's kind of the focus of this story russian traders are coming from the coast of russia coming across trading back so kamchatka is along the coast they could sell one sea otter pelt for 20 rubles but remember, their market is traveling by land all the way back to China. So again, Russian geography might not be at the top of your uh, of your list, but by the time that pelt got to Irkutsk, so that's where Lake Baikal is, that really big lake in Russia, it was worth 40 rubles. And by the time it got to St. Petersburg and was there being able to trade directly with Russia, it was worth 100 or 80 to 100 rubles. So let's put that in context of what that's worth today. So if we look at what a paper, paper ruble was worth in 1770s, it was about 70, it was the equivalent of 72 US dollars at the time. But if we roll up some inflation, uh, that was enough money for one person to be able to buy 10 cottages or 10 homes in Russia. 
That was a lot of money. And that was just one, right? And they were cranking out as many of these as they could possibly get uh, in as high as quality. So that had huge, absolutely huge effects on the populations of sea otters. So historically, the, the outline there, you can kind of look at the image, follows where you could find sea otters uh, pre, I'm gonna say pre-colonization, pre-settlers. So that's down all the way to Mexico, all the way up the coast of the US, across Canada into Alaska, follow the Aleutian Islands over, and then down Kamchatka. Uh, if anyone else also remembers from our story, when we think about the evolution of sea otters, sea otters uh, started in North America and then they spread across to Russia. So that would be the, the direction of population spread. So the estimated population when this bonanza of sea otter hunting is going on is between 150 and 300,000 sea otters. That is a lot, right? I'm going to tell you that by the time 1910 rolls around, there are less than 1% left. There is estimated to only be, sorry, excuse me, bit of the sniffles. There is estimated to only be 2,000 sea otters in total. And this is a really interesting distinction when you look at range versus population. So the range stayed relatively consistent in the north, but the population is much less, but we lost most of our historic population along the coast of the US and through most of BC, right? Now, those blue dots that you see in Canada here um, and along the coast, those are reintroductions. Those happen uh, within the last 30 to 40 years. And so the populations have been reestablishing, but that's still super duper low numbers, relatively speaking to, to what there was before. Now, there were a lot of these, right? I said they were a keystone species, which means that they're, one of their primary prey was sea urchins. This is a very common story for folks on the on the coast. Sea urchins eat our kelp, which is kind of like our nurseries of the oceans. That's where all our little baby fish grow up. So if you cut out the nurseries, you destabilize an ecosystem, which is essentially what we lost when we lost the sea otters and that massive population. Now, when they survived uh, by the 1900s, right, because it, it was still a gold rush for more or less 200 years, they were still worth a lot. There was fewer of them, started getting smaller as well. So we're growing as big a size. Um, but they survived in only 11 isolated colonies, kind of dispersed in along the Aleutian Islands, uh, one in Puget Sound. They have records of the last wild sea otters being killed in 1906 in Oregon and I think 1910 in Washington, right? So like just completely pulled away. So I kind of jumped a bit ahead into the future there or sort of walked us through a couple hundred years of what happens to our sea otter populations. but. The, the image I want to drive home for anyone who's from the Pacific Northwest or if you haven't been here was that if we roll the clock back a few hundred years, this is a place of abundance. There is so much sea life that is just teeming with it, right? And so if we think back to folks who are not from this region, who are not indigenous to it, and by that I mean a lot of our colonial powers, we could say that the cat is out of the bag. It's the late 1700s. Russia has laid claim to the coast of Alaska. The British have Hudson Bay. And they have laid claim to most of the interior of Canada into BC. The Spanish have kind of pulled out a little bit and the Americans are also there and they're all vying for this resource extraction. And so it's, uh, it's kind of interesting because we start to see how different colonial approaches result in different effects on the people and on the ecosystem. So what do I mean by that? This is what was considered Russian America at the time, sort of late eight, late 1700s into the early 1800s. And there's an interesting distinction of how these different big powers were colonizing the Pacific Northwest. One of the things to note about the Russians is that they didn't put as much, um, they didn't invest as much directly into the land. So what I mean by that is they weren't bent on building giant settlements and settling people there and claiming it that way. They were just intent on coming, taking what they could and bringing that home. Now, in contrast, we think about the British, they spend a huge amount of resources setting up settlements, setting up colonies, trying to get their people planted there. So like as an interesting note, so the Russians more or less have this for, let's just say roughly a hundred years, mid 1700s to mid 1800s. And the average population of Russians in the whole of Alaska, it's already not very populated in Alaska, right? Well, 
they kept it at about 500 to maybe 800 who would be considered Russian citizens. Now there's a bunch of people who are half indigenous and half European, and there's some other mixes like that, but just on paper, that's what they call the Russians. Now, the Russians who came to stay, or at least either came to hunt and come back, they were known as, and let's see if I can get this, the Promyslenix. Sorry, uh, my, my accent's a bit off here. So those were kind of the equivalent of our like French Canadian trappers. That's kind of who I would call them closest to. And they were their name translates into the hunters. But what's interesting is that they actually did very little hunting themselves. They would use the indigenous folks at the time, the different nations, um, to hunt and either be actively a part of it or just simply trade with them afterwards. And so these relationships, right, change the narrative of what was happening before. Before it was subsistence hunting, so these populations are there, but it was only to take enough to feed or to trade within their, their local networks. Whereas now they're trading to export. And it's kind of interesting, depending on which part of history you jump in and out of this, because when people say it's like, well, like, why do they have to participate in that? Right. And there's lots of different reasons. Um, but I'm just going to choose one right now, which is that the fact is that uh, if we take a look at what's happening broadly across all of North America with different indigenous groups, you have had not only one, but two different cycles of disease roll through. So there's a huge population loss, um, which means that communities that are generally structured around communal roles and population taking care of each other that way don't have the number of people in order to carry out the same traditional way of living. So they've lost that. And they're also losing the abundance, right? So now we're competing for this resource. So there's not enough left, to, so they can't actually access it themselves. So they have to get tied into resources from afar in order to complete their, what would have been subsistence loop. And so it's just this story that feeds back on itself. Um, you know, we, we, we weren't there at the time. I'm only using one example. Right. But uh, there's lots of different things that happen. And I guess I also want to take this time. Because when we're also looking at history, we can paint it in many different colors of brushes. And sometimes we gloss, gloss over the harsh and dirty details. And sometimes we use them as examples. Um, and so I'm not going to gloss over them. I'm also not going to try and villainize things. but there is some stuff that I think is important that gets out and and gets shared widely. And so one thing that I think a lot of folks don't know was that that era of time when these these hunters were coming, they were mostly Russians. Some of them were Russian aristocrats. Some of them were people who had been exiled to Siberia. Um, right. But essentially before the Russian government kind of took hold of things and we'll just say ran it in a different way. I'm not going to say better, but different. Uh, it was a free for all out there. And what lots of these hunters would do is they would go to these coastal communities. They would kidnap women and children and they would force the men either to travel with them and hunt or to go and hunt and bring back X number of furs. And if the men did not come back in time or in a certain amount of time, then these hunters would either, they were sexually exploit and or kill their hostages. Uh, in 1745, there was 15 women and children that were executed to set an example for these communities. So it was a form, it was a form of slavery. That is what it was. And so you have this external pressure coming in and forcing a full on removal of ways of life, of stable populations, everything gets offset. Now, there's this is what I said where the Russian government comes in. So it was the Wild West. Essentially, before there were any rules, the Russian government comes in and says, all right, we're going to change this up a little bit. And they create what is the equivalent of, for Canada, what we had is the Hudson Bay Company. They have the Russian American Company. And I'm not going to say that it ran things perfectly. But they did some things better. I still disagree with actually a lot of things that happened in the past, but I think that's just the nature of being where you're from. 
And so with the Russian American company, they set up a governor in uh, Russian America. For this fellow, his name is Baron Ferdinand Frederick George Ludwig von Wrangel. Uh, it's quite the long title. And you might know him or you might know the name at the very least from Wrangell St. Elias National Park. That's where the Wrangell Mountain Range gets its name from. For folks who followed around in parts one, two, and three, St. Elias, that mountain gets its name because it was the first one that George Steller and all those folks on that ship in 1741, it was the first piece of Alaska that they saw near, uh, very close to St. Elias Day. So what was it, June 20th, July 20th? Um, so Baron von Wrangell rolls in. And he is kind of part of this new age of approaching colonization of Russia, of Russian America. And his thing is that he kind of, he gets rid of all the vagabonds. He gets rid of the system of these hunters coming in and having exploitation. I would say people are still exploited, but now they're exploited all equally, right? That makes everything better, but we'll get to that. So he comes in 1829. So we're kind of past the Wild West era. They're trying to set up some sort of system in place both to kind of keep the British and the Americans out sort of have a, a line to defend against um, and also to organize and 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 get their resources brought up that way so he um, he's actually kind of an interesting character he uh, sets up administration sets up schools organizes different mining outlets and starts to try have egg culture he tries to make this place as stable as possible at least from his perspective um, and so Again, everything is a product of their past and time, but the reason, at least why I appreciate this character in history, is because even though some morals are a product of your time, at least he has the honesty to admit to some of the wrongs. So this is from an ethno ethnobiography he wrote when he was done being the governor in 1834. He, he wrote about the seven years, or seven years at the time that he spent there. And so I just want to read you this one passage because I think it, it speaks to a lot of what was going on at the time. Compelled by truth and humanity, I have described the conditions of the Aleuts and the Cadillacs accurately, but it would be unjust to lay the blame on the company alone. I will not maintain that in these distant regions there was no misuse of force, nor that the consequences of monopoly were not as always harmful. Only during the four years prior to 1821, in which, the com in which years the company's management issued new regulations, having received the opportunity to renew its privileges for a further period of 20 years, did the company treat the peoples entrusted to it, so those are the indigenous people to clarify, with, it, with even the generosity and care directed by the government whose particular protection of the company enjoyed. So basically, the company was given full rights to this, and the government said, stop being awful is the short version of that. So they were less awful afterwards. The injuries suffered by the peoples of this land when private traders were still visiting, so those were the, the hunters, uh, and before the latest reform of the colonial administration were, as far as possible, healed. Now, I would totally disagree with that sentence, but well, this is what he thinks is a, is a makeup for the years of torture uh, and enforced slavery. The manager and head department and departmental heads were held responsible for all oppression and offenses, and the company spent significant sums on the establishment of charitable institutions in colonial districts. Hospitals and schools were erected in New Archangel, Archangel, Kadiak, Unaska, and Atka, which were the inhabitants could use without charge. Priests were assigned to churches in these places and instructed to visit all the other places in the colonial annually. So they admit that there were like terrible wrongs that were done. So that is a step in the right direction. I think this is also the sign that that notion that Western culture is still superior and that we might have destroyed their culture, but look, we made it better because we gave them ours. So that's the part where it kind of fall off the bandwagon with me. But it's this interesting like savior complex tied in with like some base amount of humanity. Um, and so, right, his name is still hanging out on the park today, whether most people realize that it was because he was the first governor or not. Uh, and as most things, people are not all good nor all bad. Um, everyone kind of makes it through the world as best they can. But it, it sort of sets up this notion that we've taken away the culture that was there and we're going to replace it with our own. And that's kind of the next era. That's if we jump in now 
if we're shifting into the, the early 1800s, the Russian American company sort of settles in. And, but what's happening is that a lot of these resources are depleting. So if we have all of these people going after sea otters and other furs, then the competitive competition gets quite heavy. And so I said that things were better if you were indigenous, uh, but I'm not going to pretend that it still wasn't actually a form of enforced slavery. And here's one of the examples of that. So their communities have been destroyed or mostly abolished, and they're now tied to resources coming in from the outside. So coming in from Russia or coming in from the south. And if they were if they were to accept any of the resources, they were required to do a three year minimum service for any goods received by the company. So now it's not outright kidnapping, but if you want any supplies, you have to spend three years of your life working for us. If they were half indigenous and half Russian, they were, and if they were educated in, in, in compensation for their education, they had to spend 10 years of service. And so again, you can see that it's, it might be have a different flavor. And I think that, you know, some things were made better, but there is still that, um, that yoke is still put on the people. Now, again, this mix of good and bad and how this ties into history and how this ties into resources. So the Russian Orthodox Church, in the same way that we know the story of lots of missionaries traveling with resource expansion, they're the ones that are going into Russia. And so, again, it, it's for the purpose of spreading religion. But one thing I find super interesting that was a different approach um, than maybe some of the other colonial powers that were coming in was that the russian orthodox church really focused on learning all of the indigenous languages and rather they didn't try to teach people russian first they learned the languages that were there and they spent all of their effort translating the bible into those language groups and so that meant that um there was actually a really strong language resilience and so this is important when we think about the history jump between when the americans buy russia from or buy alaska from russia now, as a Canadian, I always get annoyed at this, but the only reason for the record that the Russians sold it to the US and not to Canada is because at the time, US and Britain were having, they were in the Crimean War, and so there was no way that they were gonna sell it to their enemies on this other side of the world. So they sold it to the Americans, I think for seven million or what, a lot of money at the time, but um, this one's always kind of a stick in the side as a Canadian, but that's how history works. You have to keep track of it. Okay, so now there's a big shift that what happens as far as church-wise, the Russian Orthodox Church is pulled out when the Russians no longer own Alaska and uh, missionaries come up from the south. Now, they have a much different approach and when they come up, they ban the religion. Um, and it, or Sorry, they don't ban religion, they ban language. They want everyone to be speaking English um, and anything else is heresy. Her heresy? That's not the right word. Uh, so... When that happens, a really interesting thing that ties into this is so uh, Creoles, that was the word that was used at the time for people who were half First Nation and half Russian. They actually kept secret schools alive, teaching their own language uh, for about a hundred years until there was some acknowledgement that this was wrong and terrible uh, and that it was brought back in. So maybe a bit more history, but we're gonna bring it back to Barry von Rangel because I wanna tie in his time those about 10 years that he was the first governor and these transition periods that we're seeing happen because all of those have effects and domino effects ultimately on the ecosystem. So I got my hands on some of his original ledgers, which is pretty cool to go look through actually. It's an interesting way to see the world. So this is from seven year period. I don't know when. So he was the, remember he was the governor from 1829 to 1834 so I, I can't remember the exact window of time but for a seven year period in there he kept track of everything from the number of people living in villages to exports uh excuse me to um yeah to the foods to what they were able to keep people to grow he uh, he was a very organized person which paid off so this is saying the number of animals that were exported in a seven year period so there are Right, and these these first, second, and third sizes, if you're looking at those, right, you can think about, I mean, it's both size and quality is one way to think about it, right? The bigger it is, the nicer the fur, the more they would have gotten sold for, right? So there's there's 10,000 uh, that are taken care of, right? If we're looking at sea otters, you've got almost 40,000 beavers, you've got 5,000 river otters, 
And then the foxes, I think, is interesting because the foxes here are broken down into four different categories, which species-wise, there's only two species in, North, uh, in this part of North America anyways. We've got the Arctic fox, which they're calling the polar fox here. And then there is the what we would just say is the red fox, which is vulpus vulpus. But for some reason, there's three here. So this is kind of a fun one. It's not that there are different species they're presenting. It's that at the time, there were a lot more color morphs in this area of the world for foxes. So today, color morphs are a lot more rare. Uh, and you could argue that that's because these, these, uh, what, these different color morphs were hunted intentionally because they were beautiful patterns that people went after. For anyone who's made it up to Churchill with us, we still have lots of cross foxes. We still have silver foxes up north. Uh, and you do see them in the south sometimes. But the reality is that they were preferentially hunted out of the population. And so one of the legacies of this is that we still see that today is that our our color morphs of the red fox is start, is fewer than what it was 300 years ago because of these hunting pressures. And so let's look at a few more. Right. So we've looked at kind of the sea otters uh, and then there's some land animals mixed in here, too. So and it's kind of you can think about it both of like. This is Russian America, it's coastal extraction, and that really there were lots more lynx and there were lots of wolverines, but you have to think about, there's like two vacuums, there's two forces that are competing for these. I could say three, but we'll say two for now. You've got the, the Russian America, which is trying to ship out directly to Russia, and then you've got Hudson Bay, which is trying to get the furs all going out to Hudson Bay and out uh, east along the St. Lawrence. And so, their focus wasn't on as many land animals, but you can see that they're still getting those, right? So they've got a few hundred lynx and wolverine, there's about 70 wolves in that period, quite a few bears, relatively speaking. But the big number here, well, there's also the whalebone, right? But the big number I want you to see here is the fur seal, right? Over 100,000, that's a lot, right? And so those are being hunted both for like the the fur the fur seal the reason why it's the only one that's called the fur seal is it had the highest quality of fur to being shipped out so it was one of the pinnipeds that took quite a bit of pressure at the time and they're also in von, von Rangel's journals he explains how they used to hunt the fur seal and the sea lions at the time this is, a, this is also a drawing from his uh from his recollections so what they used to do is that the they would have the indigenous people go and so they all of the sea lions and they right they they hollowed onto land the the males have their their harems that right there's a few bulls and the rest are cows or females and they're all hanging out on the beach and what they would do is that the people would sneak up as quickly and quietly as they could and they would try to cut off the population from the from the water and then what they would do is they would herd them as far inland as possible. Now, they would make a bunch of noise, they would try and scare them, and it was really, really important, especially those first few hundred meters as they were getting them further and further from the beach, is that they could not let a single one make it back to the water. Because if one turned and made it back, then the whole herd would turn on it as well because they knew that there was an escape. Now, these are not small animals. A stellar sea lion, an adult male, weighs around 2,500 pounds. An adult female weighs 800 pounds. These are big animals. And yes, they don't have necessarily teeth for biting in the same way. Well, they can get you in the water. On land, it wouldn't be quite as agile, right? That is a huge animal to not back down from. And so they would have to keep them all moving, all going together. But also, these are marine mammals. They are not made going long distances on land. Right. This drawing is actually a very small but subtle way to tell the difference between them being seals and sea lions. So the big difference is that for seals, their hips are fused. So they move on land like they're always doing the worm. Whereas sea lions, if you look their their hips are not fused. So they can actually lift themselves up and kind of waddle a little bit. And you can see that in the drawing here. You can see them upright and kind of prostrate. So what they would do is they would herd them for a couple hours they would be exhausted, let them sit for a little bit, and then herd them further. So it's also pretty practical because they're trying to get them to where they're going to process them, and trying to drag a 2,500-pound animal is a lot harder. Now, once they got them to where they were going to process them, so closer to the village and far enough from sea that they weren't going to make a run for it kind of thing, then they would then they'd actually start to cull out. So the younger females and some of the younger males could go back, 
and then they would kill the rest of them and process them. And so again, they did leave some behind, but it was a it was a huge, huge, much higher amount of population loss than there has been sort of previous previous extract, extractions. Okay. So it's not just the seals, it's not just the sea lions and the sea otters, right? Because we've opened up this narrative that this is the land of abundance, this is where there are things to go. You could say that story gets out and who makes their way up into the Bering Sea but the whalers. And they come a long ways. These are American whalers. They come from Massachusetts. They sail all the way around to come up the other side of North America because one of the first forms of oil gold rushes or the oil rush in the Arctic was not for black oil, but for blubber oil. It was worth a lot. And bowhead whales can weigh close to 100 tons and they have more at their thickest. They can have like three feet, sometimes five feet thick of blubber. That is a lot of whale oil to render down and to take home and to make a lot of money. And so this brings us up to the 1850s with the whalers. Actually, 1848 is this big year. They bother to do this trip. They, they kill all of these whales. They stay over in Hawaii and they send word out being like, hey, this is, this is the best hunting grounds. Everyone come, or at least word gets out was one way to say it. And then this is what's really interesting that happens is that there is a huge onslaught of, of whaling for about two or three years, but the whales get wise and they change their behavior. Now, bowhead whales, part of the reason why they have such thick blubber, especially in along the top, is because they're one of the few ones that can actually break pack ice. And so they, the whales, after this hunting pressure, they started living closer to the sea ice, which is too close for the ships to be able to go. And so that actually gave them a bit of a buffer. But what we can say is that it didn't last too long because they kind of, there was a bit of a lull for about 20 years and then the whalers came back with different ships and different whaling techniques and they were able to get really close to the ice. And what ended up happening was that the population dropped from around 30,000 to an estimated around 3,000. It was a huge, huge loss, sorry. <coughs> now, besides them as being beautiful, intelligent creatures on their own, and that being a tragedy, one thing that people don't think about, maybe quite as directly, is the role that whales play in their marine ecosystems. I like scientists. We sometimes make up funny names for things, or sometimes we just make up really silly names. Uh, I don't know if this makes sense or not, but we call it the whale pump. So what do I mean by that? Is that whales are one of the few animals, and also a very large animal, that goes to the surface, comes to the surface, has to breathe, goes down, and this is for both different species, whether they're feeding on krill and plankton like our bowhead or whether they're uh, feeding on octopus like our sperm whales, they go down and they represent a nutrient pump. So when they go down to the bottom, they pull nutrients that have sunk deep into the ocean back to the surface. They take a real nice big whale poo, which is again, a big whale poo, and that is one of the things that cycles a huge amount of nutrients back available to photosynthesizers. Now you might think that, oh, you know, I mean, sure, a whale has a big poo, but that's not so much. Well, think about 30,000 whales. That is a lot, right? <laughs> uh, think about how we try to manage livestock on land and feedlots. The biggest thing is managing waste. Well, in the ocean, this was very intentionally cycling nutrients. And now you've just cut out you've only got 10% of your nutrient cycle still happening, well, that's going to feed back to your whole ecosystem. Your photosynthesizers, where it's at the very base of it, which give all the energy to everybody else all the way up the line, you've just decimated one of their nutrient sources. So there are a lot of trickle-down effects when we take out some of these big, beautiful creatures. And it's not just from sort of a marine perspective, we can also think about salmon, right? So salmon represent this very integral connection between te terrestrial or freshwater ecosystems and between the marine environment. This is a pretty cool photo because uh, it's something I didn't really think about or you can think about it, but you don't realize it exists until someone can show it to you. So salmon were also something that people started chasing, right? This is a fish wheel. It essentially would roll all the fish through and it was capable of pulling out 70,000 pounds of salmon in a day when the salmon were running upstream. 70,000 pounds in a day. 
That is one wheel. This is on the Columbia River, right? Which was, again, it's a big, massive river. It was one of the, the largest populations of salmon that came up and through here. And so it was a big deal. But people realized that there was so much food here, right? Salmon kind of, the story of salmon became more abundant post Lewis and Clark. So Lewis and Clark, they hit the coast, the Pacific coast around 1805. And then they're like, hey, there's so much salmon here. And so for the next sort of 30 to 60 years, people are uh, fishing for salmon in any way they can. They've got gill nets, they've got fish wheels. Um, they actually have these like horse sign things that would like be horses pulled along the edge and, and pull, pull nets up through. And lo and behold, all of this unregulated fishing, uh, they were starting to run out of salmon. There was less salmon. And one of the first things that people were to blame was, oh, it wasn't that we were fishing too much. It's that, uh, you know, they, they didn't allow all people to fish. And they said, oh, it's because the indigenous are taking too much. It's because the, the Chinese immigrant workers are taking too much. It had nothing to do with the fact that it was a full on heyday. And so this there's a decline that starts to happen and it starts around in the 1860s and what used to be this just you know basically unlimited food source starts to get smaller and so that food source had kind of become the 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 workers food rations for those first 50 or 60 years canned salmon became a really big way of getting protein um, into the diet of a lot of different folks and so we start to see a decline and they start to acknowledge that, hey, you know, maybe we should uh, maybe we should start having some regulations about this. But I can tell you that it actually takes a really long time before anyone says, oh, we should probably have some sort of recovery acts. So this is just one specific place, but I think it's kind of a good imagery of how fish populations or at least in this case, it's spring Chinook have declined. So this is uh, Willamette Spring in Oregon. You can see the number of fish are, you know, in the hundreds of thousands in the 1800s. Then by the 1940s, we maybe have 50,000 coming up. And we do have that come, sort of being replaced with hatchery fishers, fishes. Um, but it's not quite the same. And we're still not getting back to what those really, really abundant numbers were back in the day. So let's kind of take a step back and zoom out for a second. We're talking about all of this interplay happening simultaneously, right? We're talking about the transition of different colonial powers. We're talking about uh, from subsistence to extraction and exploitation. And we're talking about these pressures happening on multiple species within a food web, right? So we have our salmon, like we were just talking about. We have our whales, that's been decreased. We have pressures on our pinnipeds being hunted in mass on land, right? From the rookeries. And so, it's not just one thing. It's all of these things happening at the same time that cause these rippling or rippling effects. And so I'm talking about these things that have all happened 300, 200, 100 years ago. And we're still living those choices today. We're still living that extraction today. The difference is that we don't know, right? Um, I didn't live out on the coast here until three years ago. And I, I think I maybe heard stories before, but one of the most common stories that I hear now is when people talk about, you know, there used to be so much salmon in the rivers that you could walk across their backs. Um, and now it's, it's almost like a folk tale, right? It's almost like babe, the big blue ox. And it's, it's, it's tied into this thing that we, we don't even, we can't even comprehend because it's so far from our reality that it sounds like a bedtime story. And so, but that, that's what the stories were, right? That's what the world was. And so we're still tied to that past. We're still living um, the changes, the fluctuations that have happened in that ecosystem. And all of them are still cycling. Some of them are going up and down. The choices we're making now all still kind of tie into that. So if we think about some of the species that we've talked about, where are they at today? right? What part of their story are we telling right now? So for our sea otters, if we go back to the 1700s, I said there was probably around 200,000 of them. And today, I think we're hanging out on maybe around 10,000, might be, right? We're in the tens of thousands. There's a few thousand up in Alaska. They've been reintroduced here. Some of the northern ones are brought down to Vancouver Island. Some have been brought into Oregon and Washington. And so the population is going up, 
uh, slowly in some places. And we can think about our whales, right? We can think about our bowhead whales. I said that they went down from around 25,000 to down to 3,000. And today, the population of bowhead whales is estimated for the, for the Bering Sea is estimated to be around maybe 17,000. So again, whaling uh, has been, our commercial whaling is no longer allowed. There has been a recovery there. The story is again going to be complicated as we see sea ice retreat going further and further north, right? Because these, they are very much tied to the sea ice. So they'll retreat with them. So again, right, it's tied into all of these different stories. Our salmon, unfortunately, are still on a massive decline. So this is from Washington Department of Fisheries and Wildlife, right? And it's just showing two different species, the coho and the chinook, and we're tracking them since around, this is tracking them since around the 70s, right? And that population has not made a recovery, right? So some of the pressures are gone, but some of them are not. And I kind of want to tie together our story here and, and end us off with our stellar sea lion, right? Let's bring it back to one of our stellar animals. Now, the stellar sea lion, right, so it was hunted in mass for quite some time, but then we have the collapse of the fur trade. But even once the fur trade collapsed, because stellar sea lions, one of their big prey, right, it's all tied together, is salmon, well, they go through what starts being different culling processes. So there is still commercial hunting of them, but between from the 1910s, 1960s, they start killing off, they, there's estimated that about 50,000 of them are killed off because people perceive them, fishermen perceive them as threats to their own livelihood. And there's some really sort of brutal stories in the past of, of how to manage that. This is, uh, this is a newspaper article. It's from the Vancouver Sun from July 1st, 1923. This was the front page, hunting sea lions with machine guns. Wolves of the sea do such huge damage to the British Columbia salmon that the government sent out an expedition composed of one Lewis gun expert and three sharpshooters to exterminate as many as possible of these mammals. Yeah. Yeah. Right? To exterminate these mammals who have lived here long before us and who are a functioning part of the ecosystem and they're the reason that there's no salmon yet not because of anything else that's going on at the time it's a bit of a brutal one and you think christina this was in the past we're so much better than that right we've come so far uh they've been protected since then 1970s we've been protecting them since then in bc because the population was so bad they've been protected in washington state since the 1990s and i can't remember when alaska started might have been at the same time so you're like, Christina, we don't, we don't do that anymore. That's not, uh, we've, we've come a long ways from there, right? Uh, have we? So our lovely sea lions today, this is a very active debate and conversation in the marine man, uh, in the management of marine ecosystems along the Pacific Northwest. If you look at the bottom here in the date, the date is October 22nd, 2020. What would a British Columbia seal and sea lion cull actually entail? Proponents are calling for the deaths of at least 75,000 seals and sea lions. It's not in the past. This is very much still an active conversation because we have a finite resource that is declining, which is the salmon. And there is a competition between who thinks they have the right to it. Is it the ecosystem or is it the consumption as a food resource? And it's just, it, even the fact that I said it that way, I feel like it's the fact that there's a dichotomy there, that it's one or the other. Um, and the fact that, you know, they think that if we take the sea lions out, it'll make things better. And this is not just sea lions. Uh, our stellar sea lions are not the only one facing this issue. This is the exact same thing, even with our sea otters, right? So we're talking about sea otters, which have not even come to 10% of their previous population. But different people whose livelihoods are tied to marine ecosystems are being upset by their reintroduction because they are destroying sea nets and they are taking their, uh, you know, they are taking crabs. They are competing for the same resources that we are in that sense. And so it gets really complicated. It's not this black and white uh, story, right? But I think the thing that I'm just like so blown away by 
is that I guess the thing that bothers me is that we think it's our choice. Um, and in some ways it is, because we have the capacity to, to choose what we do with it. But the fact is that things are not right or wrong and that everything is connected and everything is tied together. And I think this quote is such an interesting perspective of that because you realize it's all about taking sides. It's not about right and wrong, it's about taking sides. That's what's gonna decide what happens to these animals. So this is a quote from Andrew Trites. He's a uh, University of British Columbia Marine, and the Marine Mammals Research Unit. In this case, he's talking about harbor seals. He says, harbor seal populations in British Columbia have been stable for 20 years and that any massive cull would have serious consequences for the threatened transient killer whales. So those are the ones that rely on, they, they prey on seals and other marine mammals. On the other hand, if salmon populations do increase after a cull, it would benefit the endangered salmon-eating southern resident killer whale. So just in case folks didn't know, uh, orcas, they are different populations that rely on different food sources. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we have resident killer whales, which only eat salmon. They don't hunt seals or sea lions, versus we have transients, and their main food source is, is other marine mammals, so our pinnipeds. So this notion that like, you're like, how in the world could someone say we need to kill 75,000 seals and sea lions? Well, if they're, if you're pro fishing resources, if you're pro or pro salmon eating orcas, then this maybe is a good thing. If you're thinking about the function of what those marine mammals are for killer whales that are res or that are transient, right, that hunt those marine mammals, that is a huge, huge loss. And, right? It's, it's this big debate that's actually still happening today. One of the other guides, uh, Rachel Sullivan Lord, this is what she studies. She is one of the people who studies marine mammals. Or she studies sea lions and, and seals and their response to killer whales because we're trying to understand, you know, what choice we do have to make here. Uh, and I'm biased, if that's not already clear, that, right, it's not, it's not about... I mean, I, I don't really want to use this expression, but it's not about playing God. <laughs> Right. There's there's all these different ways. And I think the big thing is we just have to learn to be a part of the whole food web, a, be a part of it, not on top of it, not pulling all the strings, just be one piece in it. And so this right here uh, and it has to do our, our perspective, I think, is 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 kind of like the biggest hurdle to get over. How we saw the natural world in the 1700s was something to be taken from. How we see it now is something for us to control and puppeteer. Um, and I think we just have to kind of like revision how we want to be a part of the ecosystem. So this is this is just a very classic map, right? This is showing critical habitat for stellar sea lions along the coast of Alaska. It shows uh, right foraging areas, things like that. So that's one way we could choose to look at an ecosystem. This is another way, right? This is a satellite image of the Bering Sea, the closest point between where Alaska and Russia connect. It's only 58 miles across. It's not very far, right? And what if we stop thinking about these as different things, right? This connection between the two. What if we think about it as a whole unit? Wouldn't that be a different way to think about it? That we don't think about political boundaries, we just think about these animals that are calling this whole place home, right? So the satellite, that's like this top-down view. That's the one way we think about it. Uh, we teach this in biology. We teach these food webs as kind of this like cross-section of like, here's how everybody is connected. Right. But we could look at it differently. We could teach it. What if we taught it from the bottom up? What if you imagine laying in the hold fast in the bottom of a kelp bed and just seeing all of those nursery fishes, all of those little baby fishes making their way through it? And some of them are going to survive and they're going to grow into big, beautiful salmon. And some of them are going to get eaten and they're going to feed the, up, the further up food chain. And I don't know whether it's for us to decide whether or not which ones get eaten and which ones don't get eaten. Right. But I think that it's for us to be a part of them having, at least in the very get go, that nursery bed to, to grow from and to start from. Right. What if we, you know, if we go back to this food web notion. Right. And we can look at it from the from the perspective of all of these different animals. We can look at the exact same food web and see it a much different way. Right. This is a little baby stellar sea lion um, that will you see they're, they're growing into their flippers or their fins still. Right. So rather than thinking about do we choose to cull, do we choose to not cull, how do we look at the food web from this sea lion's perspective? Right. I think if we can start to try and shift things in that direction, hopefully we can reinstate or, or reconnect this big, beautiful web and, and all the different ways that uh, that we exist in it and alongside it.
And with that, I'm going to finally bring our four parts of following George Stellar's animals to a close and pass it back to you, Rob. All right. Thank you so much, Christina. Now, I would like to remind everyone it, that if you do have any questions, you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. So um, as some of our guests are saying, uh, we need to make reparations to the animal world. Um, so are there anything in particular that we can do to help object or prevent from the killing of seals or sea lions? Yeah, I think, I think the biggest one is, is awareness. Uh, well, two, there's two parts to this I think about. One is being aware. I think most people don't realize that this is even a conversation going on. Um, and so it's this notion that, right, instead of thinking about how do we, you know, how do we manage an ecosystem, I think trying to change the narrative to how do we participate in it. Um, and the reason why these culls haven't happened in mass is because as soon as it kind of bubbles to public levels, people are like, wait, what? Why is this a conversation? But the problem is that on small levels, these things do happen. Um, and it's not that I, I guess I fundamentally disagree with it, but the reality is that these small scale culls that happen. So just as one example here in Victoria, they killed 50 seals about five years ago in, on this one area to protect um, small, so young salmon coming in and out of this one stream. And on one hand, you're like you're choosing the survival of one species over the other and it is true that one is one is endangered in sheer numbers wise but you, if you take a step back you look at the things like well these 50 animals are being sacrificed because we have a bigger systems problem right rather than saying hey maybe we need to cut back the amount of commercial salmon uh fishing for a little while so that population can stabilize right that is like it's these system approaches right so um it's really thinking about how right like how do we how do we pay for things ourselves and not ask for another species to pay for it right that's that's really what it is it's like the the piper has come calling in some ways um and I, like it's a tricky one so i think that one as far as just being aware if you're a coastal community and if you're not a coastal community that's also fine look around at your ecosystem and think about um you know who like a very common one just because we're humans we, we tend to kind of be afraid of other predators but right like lots of ecosystems coexist beside functioning uh predator prey systems right is it bears where you live is it wolves right sea lions are often called sea wolves there are very very fair comparisons there and so just think about what does it mean for your ecosystem to be attacked to be intact right you know who and when I say who, I mean which species, but, but who needs to be there for your ecosystem to have some resilience and stability? Because I think that's what what's kind of terrifying people. Sorry, I realize this is jumping into something else, but people are scared because there isn't any resilience left. When we talk about abundance, that's one thing. You know, you talk about so many salmon, you can walk across their backs. You talk about all of these whales and the fun whale pump. But it's this notion that if you live in a world where if you take one piece you know one 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 whale out or one salmon out it doesn't all crumble but we've gotten our ecosystem to such a fragile point that we're that every single one actually counts now because our ecosystem can't shift and and come back from it right so and and so we're trying to stabilize that resiliency by taking other pieces out rather than fortifying the whole system rather than diversifying it and i think that's the management cue right like that's the part Whatever aspect you can participate in, think about how do you make your own ecosystem resilient? And that might even just be picking up a piece of trash, but maybe it is also like stripping some invasive species where you live, right? And it doesn't have to be a lot, right? But the biggest thing I think is like time. How do we put in time to make our own ecosystems more resilient? So that, I think that's like a, that's an ask maybe. Great. Thank you, Christina, for that thoughtful answer. We don't have any more questions, but we have lots of thanks for this wonderful series. We do appreciate you bringing it to us. Uh, I'm going to throw it back to you for any closing comments you might have for us. Thank you, everyone, for for wandering through the years of history with me. Um, yeah, I just I appreciate everyone who's tagged along, whether you came for the whole journey or part of it. But I just 
I think it's so important to understand how we got to where we are to make good choices. Um, I could say it lots of more elegant ways, but I feel like that's really the most important t part to me. And I feel like that's, you know, that's my time, I guess, when we talk about how can I put in time. This is, I hope, one of the ways I can put in time to sort of move us towards that um, and to increase that awareness. So please share stories. Please share this story or other stories with people that you know. That's how we all kind of get the engine rolling in a good, good direction. Um, but thank you for your time. Thank you so much. I think I'll be back the 18th of April. I don't know what we're going to do yet. We'll see what, uh, what we stumble into then. But it'll be a good story, I promise. All right. Thank you so much. And I'll pass it back to you, Rob. Thank you so much, Christina, for taking that time to present this for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. If you are interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, please give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We will see you next time.